welcome Programme Committee Chair, RSA Conference, Hugh Thompson. Hey, everybody. Hello. Wow. Good afternoon. How, RSA Conference 2023, how has it been? Good? Okay. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And one more round of applause for DJ Shifty. That was incredible. That was incredible. I, just one memorable quote from that was, ChatGPT can be your dating wingman. I'm like, oh, I wonder what session that was from. I'm not sure. But an incredible compilation. And I wanted to just start off by saying thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for, for all the discussions, the participation. I mean, you could just feel the energy this week of more than 40,000 of you. 40,000 coming together, sharing. Absolutely incredible. And we have an amazing show for you this evening. I am just absolutely thrilled by our guests, by the topic. You notice this is the quantum edition of the Hugh Thompson Show, our first ever, and maybe not our last, actually, on this topic. You may have also noticed a conspicuously lighted DeLorean at the back, uh, of, or you may not have noticed it. And I, I will tell you that Christopher Lloyd is in the building right now as we speak. I got back to my hotel room at, I want to say like 11 o'clock or something last night, and I couldn't resist. I watched Back to the Future 1 again for like the 180th time probably. I just it's so iconic. And we've got two other incredible guests to explore quantum, which has been an interesting topic this week. It has profound implications to some of the cryptographic primitives that we all rely on, and so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch of other things uh, in just a little while. It, it is going to be a terrific show. But before we get started, I wanted to share with you a personal security story just to, to set a little bit of context. And this is something that, that happened about, I want to say just over two years ago, so the beginning of 2021. I'm going and you know, getting the mail, and I see in the mail there's a USPS priority envelope. So I'm like, well, somebody paid some good money to send this quick, so let me open it up. And inside, there were two fascinating objects. So uh, let's show the first one, which is a check for almost $3,000, right? $2,930, so it certainly piqued my interest. Uh, and it came with uh, a set of instructions, and you know, we have them uh, up here uh, as well. And you'll see at the top left, it's got you know, agent number, right? So it's, it's got some intrigue to it. And then it goes on to talk about, hey, here's this check. What we need you to do is deposit it in your bank or cash it right away. And then we want you to go to your local Walmart and buy a whole bunch of gift cards. And it gives you instructions about how to buy them. And like, if somebody says, well, why are you buying all those gift cards? Like, what do you tell them? It's like, oh, my family really loves Walmart. You know, those kinds of things. Immediately, I recognize what this is. It's something called a secret shopper scam. Now, I'm sure some of you may be aware of this. Some of you may not be aware of this and may be planning to go to Walmart shortly if you've received one. Do not do it. Do not follow the instructions of this thing. Uh, what happens is ultimately the check doesn't get processed, and you're on the hook for the payment for these you know, gift cards at Walmart. You scratch off the back, you send the pictures and text them to the criminal, and then they use the funds. So it's a, a very, very common scam. There's a friend of mine in the US Postal Inspection Service that once showed me tractor trailer loads of these things. So I know this is a really common thing. So 
I'm not too worried about it. You know, I'm in cyber, but I'm pretty paranoid. But I know that a lot of people get these things, so fine. However, over the next two days, we started to get dozens and dozens and dozens of these things. And now I'm starting to get a little bit worried. And I'm, have I been identified as particularly gullible for this kind of stuff? You know, is, is there somebody else in the house, right? Like one of the kids, right? But then I'm like, geez, these kids are, you know, too young to even, you know, some of them even to read or write. So it's probably unlikely uh, that they're the targets. And then I take out the envelope that I originally opened. And I, I, I think we've got a picture of it. I've got it. Uh, one of them right here, uh, the other, you know, several hundred uh, now are at the house. And what happened is that this was actually intended for another person. So it was addressed to somebody else, and it was folks all over the country. But the return address was my house. So I'm thinking about this for a little while, and while I wasn't originally concerned, now I start to get hyper-concerned, right? You know, first, am I being targeted, right? That's, that's a natural thing that you would think. But then the real threat started to manifest in my head, which is, well, wait a minute. If we are getting some returned ones, and my guess is, you know, this is hopefully a diligent crew of cyber criminals that sent this stuff out, that they're not sending them to random addresses. So we're probably seeing like some tiny fraction of undeliverable ones. What about the maybe 10 to 20,000 of them that actually got to real victims? Maybe they went to Walmart, maybe they got the gift cards, and now maybe they realize they're out like $3,000 of their own money. Who are they going to come after? <laughs> right? It's probably, probably, probably the person in that return address. And so I wanted to be fairly calm about this as I explained it. <laughs> to my wife and like, look, have you seen any suspicious cars or, you know, anybody angry on the street? And I put in a bunch more security cameras. And, but I, I, I bring this up, A, because it was terrifying and, you know, it's therapeutically helpful, helpful for me to share it with you. Uh, but B, the problem here was the design point around physical mail. I, when you write a letter to somebody, for example, you can put whatever you want in the return address. Santa Claus, North Pole, Christopher Lloyd, the future, you know, whatever. And you just assume that, like, whatever you wrote up there, or the recipient assumes that it came from that individual. Unfortunately, our first pass at email was based on this same concept, right? the SMTP protocol. Again, you could say that you're sending this thing from ever, anywhere. We then tried to layer security on top of these things to add digital trust. And how did we do it? We did it mostly through certificates and signing and then through DMARC and DKIM. But what would happen if one day all of these compensating mechanisms for digital trust, all of these signatures that we use to verify firmware, that we use to verify signed documents, that we use to verify binaries, what if that cryptography could be broken? And that is a real possibility with quantum computing. So today, we are going to explore that topic. Not all gloom and doom. There are some positive things to quantum computers you know, developing. And with that, I would like to welcome my first guest, an, an amazing, amazingly accomplished physicist. She's a professor of physics at Wilfrid Laurier University. Please welcome Shohini Ghosh. Hey, Shohini. Thanks so much Hello. for being here. Nice oh, to meet please. you. Please, have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, 
So first, thanks for making the time for this. And Happy to be here. You have studied you know, quantum computing for a very long time, actually contributed very heavily to the field. And I wanted to ask you to just please, if you could, in under two minutes, explain a very complicated topic of what is a quantum computer in a way that is completely exhaustive and very, very easy to understand. Go. No problem. I'll just get chat GPT to do it. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it actually probably would do a good job. OK, please. I'm going I'm to go with a real professional. Go with... um, yeah, so quantum computing is actually not one more step in our you know, normal computing progress map. It's a whole different type of computing. It's a different framework. And one way I like to think about it is to compare a candle and a light bulb, or a horse and carriage versus a car, or a rocket ship even, because those are all technologies that have maybe a similar goal, making light or getting from point A to point B, but they use very, very different scientific models to do it. You cannot build a better light bulb, by, or even any light bulb, by building better candles. And similarly, you cannot build a quantum computer just by building better and better regular computers, because the mathematics of computing itself is different, meaning our normal 0 and 1 bit approach, or, which is really a great approach to computing. If you think about it, it's kind of simple, easy to understand. Uh, we like it, yeah. We uh, like it. So, and it's been working pretty well it's been all this time. It's been working pretty good, yeah, yeah. It gave us chat GPT. <laughs> there, there you go. I don't know if that's working all right, well. All right, we'll, we'll, <laughs> but, we'll, we'll defer, that, <laughs> defer that topic. But actually, thinking in binary with just a 0 or a 1 it's actually pretty limiting. Turns out, if you broaden uh, your, the framework to include probabilities of a, a particular uh, object, your fundamental information holder, which we call a bit, but in quantum we call it a qubit for, for quantum bit, a qubit can have a probability of being a zero or a probability of being a one, and we don't know whether it is a zero or a one, which seems like it would be really not precise to do computing with that, but it's actually an extra knob, and it allows us to broaden how to think of computing itself, to cleverly maneuver through this, what we call a superposition of zero and one, to be able to explore a much larger landscape and do better algorithms. And that's quantum computing. It, it's, uh, it's such a fascinating concept and so, so hard to get your head around because there's not, not a lot of normal analogs to you know, as, People use the partially dead cat in a black box like this, and you know it's only alive or dead when you open it. But the application of it to, as you say, exploring many paths at once is, is fascinating. What are the applications or potential applications of quantum computers? What, what can they do for us? Well, once you start embracing this bigger approach to computing, you, you, you want to do the same kind of tasks, such as you want to do calculations faster. You want to be able to apply it to all of the big global challenges, such as healthcare or climate change. And it turns out that using quantum-based algorithms, we may be able to do things like search through large data sets fa much faster. And that has huge numbers of possible applications, such as you know, analyzing climate data or looking at financial data. And anything where you know, data processing has a role to play, that would be where we could use these kinds of algorithms. But also very exciting is the idea of quantum simulation. And I'll use a bit of an analogy to give you an idea of why it might be better to use quantum computers. So think of somebody gives you a, a Lego box and says, use the pieces in the Lego box to make a nice soccer ball. OK, but you know, Lego boxes don't usually have round, rounded kinds of uh, pieces. So you've got to be really clever and put together all the pieces to kind of make a nice spherical shape. But it's not quite right, because you can't get a nice round piece. But what if you had a, had a Lego box which was bigger, and you had round pieces in there too, right? Curved surfaces. So if you put that together, you could make that same um, soccer ball, but with less pieces and better. So quantum computers are kind of like that. If you wanted to do simulations of molecules, which are electrons and atoms, and try to 
uh, describe and analyze every quantum property, then of course a toolbox which also works on quantum principles, which is what the quantum computer would be, that's the better Lego box. So we could use those kinds of approaches to do simulations better for drug development, for better development of, let's say, solar cells, or anything where you're doing any kind of materials design. Quantum sensors could be improved. So there's all kinds of interesting possibilities. Not all of them are po positive, and I'm sure you're going to bring that up at some point, but yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the topics you know, we've been talking about this week, which is something obviously you're very familiar with, is some algorithms that we believe theoretically might be able to break some of the asymmetric cryptography that we're using you know, all over the place, like Shor's algorithm. And I'd say an, an open question in the mind of, of a lot of people is, how should we think about how far along quantum computers are today? Like, where, you know, where might we be in 10 years? Or, you know, your, your guess would be way better than ours. So, so what, how far along are we, and, and where might we get to when, do you think? Well, I'm not sure if my guess would be much better, because anybody who tries to predict technology always gets it wrong, right? That we won't hold that. you to it. It's <laughs> not like we're going to replay this 10 years. Shreena, you said 10 <laughs> years ago. It's, you know, it's a good question, and yeah, thank you for not holding me to it, but I'll give it a guess. Um, we know now that you know, companies like IBM and Google and others, everybody now has a, bit, uh, has a roadmap of how they're developing this technology. I'll say right now, we only have what we call small-scale computers, quantum computers, that are great for prototyping and benchmarking, but they are not able to do any kind of problem that current computers can't already do pretty well. So we're not there yet. Um, and the other problem is that these computers are really, really noisy, meaning there's all kinds of errors happening all the time. Um, and that's really important. Just like you know, our regular computers also, of course, have errors. The only reason all of our emails work the way they're supposed to do is because there's always error correction happening in the background. So the same thing applies for uh, quantum computers. We'd have to do error correction to make these computers work perfectly. The problem is that error correction is much harder on a quantum computer. And uh, the errors occur if these computers using current technologies, if they heat up, kind of like our regular computers, except Quantum computers have to be kept at temperatures colder than outer space. So that's a much, much stricter rule. And so currently, no company is actually doing quantum error correction, although in principle, we have a theoretical framework that allows us to do it. We don't have those kinds of computers being rolled out as yet. So given all of those challenges, I'd say you know, probably a decade from now, there's I'd say 60% chance of okay. getting a little well, robust, right. scalable quantum computer. Okay, so material <laughs> chance, it. it's not like a 0.01% chance. No, there's, there's a good chance, which is exactly why governments are very interested. Um, security standards have to be changed. Companies are racing forward, and there's you know, billions being invested. So all of that gives you some idea of where this is going. So it's, it's, it's good to know. So it's not something, you know, me and my kids could build in my basement because we, we've recently gotten access to funding. Somehow a lot of checks have come into the home uh, recently. So it's not, we, we don't have a zero degree Kelvin environment and uh, this, this wouldn't be something we could build. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask you about you know, another just incredibly important piece of work that you've been doing around bringing women into physics and highlighting the work of women in physics. And you know, we were talking on the phone a few weeks ago and I was just blown away by how many discoveries in physics actually were power, powered by a team of a couple of men who may have been the ones that things were named after and then some incredibly intelligent women. So if you could just talk about that, that would be great. Sure, um, you're like, absolutely right. Almost all of the major discoveries in physics, and not just physics, of course, but I focus in physics, almost all of them have involved women, whether you're talking about the Big Bang or uh, you know, dark matter, the discovery of dark matter, or, or absolutely quantum physics, you know, this whole field of entanglement. 
uh, which the Nobel Prize was um, awarded just last year for the people who did the first experiments. Three men got the, got the Nobel Prize for their experiments. However, the very first experiment that actually was able to observe entanglement between pairs of photons, which are particles of light, was a woman named Wu Chinxiang. And uh, that is often ignored. And she certainly actually, while she did that and many other experiments, she never got the Nobel Prize. All of that credit was given to men. This is such a common effect that it has a name. It's called the Matilda effect. So um, unfortunately, this is uh, not something that is getting much better. But one of the things I like to do is try to correct the story. And I've recently written a book about all these um, um, discoveries and contributions that women in physics and astronomy have made. And it is all available for pre-order. Um, and, and what's the name of the book? The, uh, the name is Her Space, Her Time. Her Space, Her Time. Yes. OK, so, great. It's, it sounds like, it almost sounds like you know, a, a focused, hidden figures type of a book. It Which is, was actually. amazing. It was fascinating. That's exactly it. In fact, that's what the blurb says. <laughs> oh, OK. OK, well, there you go. <laughs> thank you for no, that. No, no, no. I'm looking forward to reading it. Well, Shohini, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, thanks for your contributions, and thanks for everything you've done. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'd like to welcome up uh, our next guest, who is no stranger to this audience. He is such an accomplished cryptographer, but I guess the only thing that eclipses his accomplishments in his cryptography is his unbelievable humility. In fact, you saw him earlier this week when he won the RSA Conference Prize for Excellence in the Field of Mathematics Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Kotcher. Hey, Good Paul. To see you. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you, man. Have a seat. Have a seat. Dude, I like to walk on music. It's like a superhero kind of music, man. That's good music. Did you set that up? Or? No. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I digress. <laughs> I digress. Paul, it is always so great to talk to you. And you know, I, I know, I know, I've been guilty of, you know, you've been an innovation sandbox judge for many years, a program that we did on Monday. And I've often called you the Simon Cowell of innovation sandbox because you, you know, have very sharp questions for, for folks, very, very good, intelligent questions. But you are inherently an optimist, despite those questions, I know. And I, I wanted to ask you, how real is this concern or this threat around public key cryptography, quantum computers, and what are your thoughts on when we might get to a, a quantum, you know, a cryptographically relevant quantum <laughs> computer? Well, so let me actually peel back the onion a little bit and then try to put the onion back together. So that was a bad analogy. No, I like um, it. I so, like it. Like, yeah, putting the, it back together. There's yeah, a okay. lot of hype around quantum computing. There are announcements in the paper, it seems like, every week of somebody pushing something forward. And that's really important work. But the thing that our community worries about is the arrival of a cryptographically relevant quantum computer. That was the phrase that you used. And that's a quantum computer that has kind of three main properties. One is it's got the generality or the power to actually break crypto, and it has to have the scale needed to do it, and it has to have the stability needed to do it. And we don't really have any of those pieces put together um, in a way that has any threat to current cryptography, but we're afraid that might happen. It's probably not, I think I'm a little more pessimistic than Shahini was, but um, even if it's a 10 or 20% chance in the next 10 or 15 years, that's enough that we still have to go and respond to it. The other kind of maybe more cynical aspect of it is that we're, we have to deal with it. We're getting requirements. The requirements are coming from a good place, um, sorry, or from the right mindset that we have to go secure our systems. So even if we're not sure whether it's 50% or 10% or even 3%, the consequence if it comes and we're not prepared is huge. All of our public key algorithms fail. Um, we lose RSA, we lose ECDSA, we lose Diffie-Hellman, we lose everything. Um, so 
on the public key side. The symmetric side, we're actually okay. Quantum computers do have a technique. It's called Grover's algorithm. It will let somebody break AES a little bit faster, but if you use 256-bit keys or security parameters, um, you're completely fine there. So the symmetric side, it's a sort of you know, upgrade in the same way that maybe DES to AES was. But on the public key side, we're off in uncharted territory without really any kind of a good roadmap for where we're supposed to go. Well, let, let me ask you, I mean, so, so much of, I'd call it digital trust today, is based on these asymmetric algorithms, like for example, signing your firmware and checking it, right? Yep. Asymmetric is a public key that's stored maybe in hardware. And there's many other things like the transactions on the web. I and mean, you were you know, the designer, the co-designer of SSL, so you would definitely know about that. And I'm curious, how long would it take us to replace our current infrastructure with, with a better one? NIST has obviously been running this competition around new algorithms and lattice space. What, what does this mean? Like, what, 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 what should we do right now? Should we like, run out of the room and start like, replacing these algorithms? Well, yes, we need to replace algorithms. The question of how long, it's actually hard to say because we haven't really ever finished a transition. MD5 is still being used. Single DES is still being used. Which, so, I might add, that this gentleman helped to get decertified as you developed an architecture with deep crack to break DES very quickly. That was Thank, so long thanks ago. Thanks for that, man. So, That's but, took, so, uh, many hours of my life uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, many people here. There's two things, though, that we should do now. So there's some things we have to worry about when quantum computers are here and we have them as a present threat. But there's two things we've got to do now. One is there are a few kinds of signing keys that have kind of very long-term um, requirements, we can't upgrade them. So if you're building a chip and you want to sign the firmware that's going to be loaded into it, that key is really, really hard to change. Like, you can't change chips once they're in people's hands. So those keys need to be replaced with something that's quantum resistant. And actually, that's kind of one of the bright spots. We have these hash-based signatures. They're super well understood. They're super robust. They're very fast on the verifying side. They're a little messy on the signing side, but you don't sign, hopefully, that many firmware images, please, I hope. So that's one area where we have a pretty clear roadmap of what to do. Um, the other area that's, uh, is the one of information with long-term privacy requirements. And there are a surprising number of those, and some of them are in the private sector, some are in the government sector. I mean, just to give an example, um, long ago, 1940s, the Soviets reused some of their one-time pads which is you're never supposed to do. You shouldn't use one-time pads anyway, but <laughs> I mean, using one-time pads and reusing them was kind of two mistakes. That's against and the definition of a one-time pad. Right? Yes, yeah. and so they were using two-time pads. Two-time pads, yeah. Uh, yeah. 1942 to 1945. Uh, US and others captured some of the message. The Armory Signals Intelligence Service started analyzing them. They kept analyzing those until about 1980. Wow. And didn't declassify the work until, I think, 1995. So you're looking at, you know, 50 years of secrecy around those kinds of communications. And when you look at a protocol, I'll take SSL as an example, because I'm responsible for its mistakes. Um, I have no idea what information might go over that protocol. There are people who are using it to watch you know, the latest comedy. There are people who are using it to send their most sensitive information around. The same protocol has to work for everything. It, the protocol isn't aware of whether your information is important or not. So we have to harden the whole infrastructure. And actually, do you want the good news or the bad news? I you're, definitely want the good. After okay. all of that, I want the good news first. Okay, you're in such a good mood. Let's, keep, let's prolong that okay, for, for just right. a little bit here. Okay, please. So, the, I mean, the good news is that you know, NIST has run this process. They did a great job on the process in terms of the structure. They haven't done a great job with everything. So when I say they've done a great job, it's not that I love NIST. It's just that this one and some of the others, they've done a really, really great job. Um, we've got some recommendations from them. Um, we've got algorithms that are fast, they're free, you can put them into protocols, and so long as they actually end up being robust, we can just switch over to them, and we're all good. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thanks for being here and joining. Okay, no, all right, go, go ahead. What's the bad news? Yeah, go ahead. Well, the bad news is the switchover is kind of like doing a brain transplant. 
And <laughs> oh my God. Well, it's actually kind I, of. I thought you would get to parody where like the good news was good and then the bad news was equally as bad. But well, it's actually kind of worse really than that because you like the AES, DES to AES upgrade. At least the brains were the same size. And we also have to do for a lot of so for for TLS and a few protocols you can negotiate. So you can upgrade one end and then the other later. But for the long tail of protocols, they don't have this ability. So you have to upgrade everything simultaneously, or else you end up with incompatibilities. And we don't know how to really do this. So this is um, a great ending and, note. And, for our yeah, you, you put me between Shohini, who was like so charismatic and bubbly. And you've got Christopher Lloyd afterwards. You, you kind of messed the show planning up here. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Thank oh. you. Thank you further for your commentary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's other problems, too. Like, we want to use hybrid modes. We want to use our current crypto because so long as quantum computers don't have a breakthrough, it's, it seems to be OK. And we also want to use the, the quantum resistant algorithms. But we're scared that there could be problems with those. I mean, of the kind of late finalists, we had two fail catastrophically. We had Rainbow and Psych both get broken with like, you know, not even requiring a quantum computer break, like you know, hours on a laptop level break. So the ones that we've got coming out that are based on lattices, they may be OK. But if you really care a lot about security, you don't want to put all your eggs in that basket either. And we don't have standards for how to do these hybrid modes. So it's kind of messy. OK, OK, OK. Well, so, so based. Based on that collection of things, right? So Shohini puts it at 60% in 10 years. You put it at less than that, right? There is also this other factor of the NSA has come out and published some dates that, look, you have to move to these quantum resistant algorithms or else power of the purse, you know, we're not going to, to buy technology that has it in it. What do you recommend, knowing how long it takes to replace some of these use cases? The folks in here are, are running security for major companies, countries. You know, what do you recommend that they do now? Well, I'm going to get in trouble with some of the cryptographers to say this, but the first thing to worry about is actually not this problem. If the worst thing in the world were the threat of quantum computing, and that was the only threat we had to worry about, I would be so happy. And if I could like, swap the world where that was the only thing, I would push that button and go for it. That, so the bugs in software are still the, you know, the main issue, the human error. So when you look at these upgrades, the question then is, can you do it in a way where you help with those risks too, or do you make those risks worse? So if you do a panic kind of let's kind of stick some band-aids and graft an extra brain on the side of this organism and send it out in the world, that's probably going to put you in a worse space than if you didn't do it. But on the other hand, if you can take your legacy C code and rewrite it in a memory safe language and use modern tools and actually do some static analysis and um, understand your systems better, you're going to get these multiplying benefits of dealing with this and modernize, moder modernizing. So if you can be in that space, that's great. We're going to get long-term benefits from that. That long tail I talked about has a lot of other exposures, too. So energy going into you know, inventorying what algorithms you've got, doing basic hygiene, you know, these things are going to pay off. And we should be doing them anyway. And this is an extra motivation to do that. So it sounds like don't try and put the Band-Aids on, but try and start the home renovation as soon as possible. Absolutely. OK. Absolutely. And 10 years is not that long. It's a, no, it's, it's not a, that long. It sounds like so long that you'll, you know, you'll be at another job by then. But if you're actually looking at the number of like, getting the key management systems upgraded and getting the hardware designs changed, and you, know, you start looking at everything, it's going to be really, really hard to be anywhere close to done when that timeline is out. Well, Paul, thank you for that uplifting <laughs> and inspiring discussion. But, I, but I, honestly, I just wanted to thank you for the amazing contributions that you've made in this space. It's, if you look through the laundry list of things that you've done and the ways that you've made us better, it is profound. The number of vacations I've ruined. No, but, yeah, that's but true, it's too. Been an that's amazing week too. here. Thank you very much for organizing this show and the program here. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of it, Paul. Appreciate it. Okay. <laughs>